Osteoporosis, a condition in which bones become less dense and weaker, affects millions of older American women and men. The loss of bone strength can increase the risk of fractures, pain, and disability. In the elderly, osteoporosis fractures can even be life-threatening. On today's Health Talk, we'll discuss the risk factors for osteoporosis and what you can do to keep your bones strong and healthy. So please join us. We're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. And I'm Dr. Andrea Peterson. Today we're going to talk about osteoporosis. It's a serious bone condition which is both preventable and treatable. Joining us is Dr. Robert Altbaum. Bob is a senior internist with the Western Connecticut Medical Group. Over the course of his many years in primary care, Bob has treated hundreds of patients at risk for and with osteoporosis. Welcome back to Health Talk, Thank Bob. Great to have you here. Happy to be here. So maybe you can start our viewers off by explaining a little bit about what, what is osteoporosis? Uh, well, osteoporosis has a definition, but basically it's when the bone has less bone mass, it becomes less dense, and it actually the architecture, just the microscopic changes in the bone as well, the end result is it becomes increasingly fragile and leads to fracture. Uh, so the most important thing is it's, it's bone that isn't as dense as it used to be and has a greater risk of fracture, which is the end result and the major problem with osteoporosis. That's, that's interesting because I think people don't think of bone as a living part of our body. They think, you know, you got bone, it's sort of like rock, that's it's true. there. So, so, you know, how does bone... Bone, get... bone is living tissue and it, it undergoes constant what's called remodeling or change. There are little cells called osteoclasts that chew it up and there are cells, osteoblasts, that relay down. So it's like a bricklayer that's constantly fixing the building. It's constantly responding to the stresses of your body's change. In fact, every 10 years, the entire skeleton is new, which I think is, you know, people well, think, that's of, I didn't think, know that. think of people as a kind of an erector set. It's just static, and it's not. It's constantly changing. That gives both good and bad. You can, if, the, if the chewing up the cells that are removing tissue and bone outweigh or overwhelm the cells that are laying it down, the bone mass goes down. And eventually that can reach a critical level where you can actually fracture. And losing bone mass is really part of aging for women and men, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of things that really kind of contribute to osteoporosis. There are some that are modifiable and some that are fixed. Uh, for instance, age is it's an inevitability. Your greatest bone mass is when you're about 30. And at 30 years old, you have You really peak, peak at 30, don't you? Your you mind peak at, peaks well, at 30, your athletic well, ability. And other things. And it's, and it's downhill but, from but there. But it's a, it's a decline. Women, unfortunately, when they reach the menopause and they lose their hormones, they actually decline a little faster for a few years, which is why it seems to be more common that they get osteoporosis. Plus, they don't have as high a peak to begin with. So there's a natural uh, factor of aging with decline. But there are a lot of other things, that some of which you can't control, like uh, your age, your gender, as I said, women. Uh, racially, uh, Caucasians and Asians have a greater risk of osteoporosis than African Americans, which is, again, just nature of your family history. If mom or dad had osteoporosis or fractured a hip, that puts you at greater risk. You can't change that. But those are the non-modifiable factors uh, that put you at risk. And there are a lot of things you can do to minimize your and risk. I would think knowing your non-modifiable factors should influence how aggressively you pursue right. some of the modifiable Absolutely. factors. Absolutely. And it also influences sometimes when you're going to test people, when you're going to actually do screening for that. Uh, the modifiable factors that are common, uh, there are a lot of diseases that can be associated with osteoporosis, but the everyday factors, things like smoking, uh, I haven't found anything smoking that is smoking is good for, uh, but smoking also hurts osteoporosis. Uh, it kills the cells that lay down the bone. So uh, smoking, drinking partly by affecting bone mass and also by increasing falling, being sedentary. Uh, activity sends signals to the body that you need good bone, and the body actually is able to remodel the bone and make it stronger. And good nutrition. Uh, to some degree, everybody needs calcium and vitamin D because those are the, the kind of the building blocks of bone, and having an adequate amount of calcium and vitamin D contributes. You can, you can be active. You can be, uh, take your vitamin D. You can avoid cigarette smoking. You can avoid alcohol in excess. And the end result is you can at least improve the things that is under your control. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about what kinds of activity are best for bones because you really need some weight bearing to That's true. give those Very signals to the point. bones. There are, there's, there's a difference, or not a disconnect, but a difference between what's good cardiovascularly and what's good for bone. Swimming is a great cardiovascular exercise. Biking is a great cardiovascular exercise. But when you think about it, when you're swimming, you're buoyant. 
you have no weight. I mean, that's one of the reasons it's, it feels good on your back. And you, well, that doesn't really help bone because the bone isn't getting the weight signal, the stress signal you know, to they, remodel. When they send up astronauts up into space and they've been there and for months, they lose considerable amount that's of right. bone That's right, and they're mass. doing a lot of activity. They're right. constantly in right. motion. Yeah. So uh, uh, swimming and biking, which I would never say are bad, they're wonderful cardiovascular fitness activities, don't help bone. But walking helps, running helps, to some degree working on the elliptical hurts helps. Uh, you could put a backpack on or use heavy hands and just add a little weight. And again, the, the bone gets the signal of the weight and the activity, and then it starts to remodel and strengthen. It's very interesting as a, as, as a as someone who's interested in engineering, you know, the weight on the bone actually creates certain electrical signals in Absolutely. the bone itself that says we need to get stronger. It's sort of the use of it. We don't quite it. fully understand it, but that's true. There are electrical kind of charges, and then they send out chemicals, and then the chemicals revitalize the bone production. So th that doesn't mean one should be obese, though, because that puts well, that stress on Well, you don't want to be obese, bone. and you don't want to be too thin. Uh, you know, there's a rule you, you can't be too thin. In, in osteoporosis, actually, one of the risk factors for fracture is having a thing called a BMI, which is just a, te a, a term we use for, for weight. If your BMI is below 20, which is very thin, you actually have a greater risk of fracture. So being too thin is actually a risk factor. You want to be healthy weight. You don't mm -hmm. want to be obese, uh, but you certainly don't want to be too thin. Obesity actually does send weight signals to the bone that strengthens bone, but there are a lot of other reasons right. not to be you obese. Maybe with that you could talk a little bit about uh, a healthy diet in terms of preventing osteoporosis. Well, again, most, most, the most important thing in osteoporosis is, is really an adequate, you want an adequate diet, but you want an adequate amount of vitamin D, and vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin, so theoretically you could get it just going out in the sun for 20, 30 minutes a day, but they did a very big study in Boston, and 50% of the people in Boston were vitamin D deficient during the winter. The same people might have had a very good vitamin D during the summer. So you need some kind of supplemental vitamin D. It's in milk, it's in a variety of foods, but the best way to get your vitamin D actually, I think, is to take a supplement. And there are different organizations that have different recommendations, but a simple rule of thumb is a thousand units, and that, again, that may not- How, how about thousand dairy units. products? You know, they build strong bones, that's what we were brought well, up. Dairy, calcium is probably good for bone. You certainly need some degree of calcium. How much calcium is always debated. Again, a, a rule of thumb is about 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. Now, if you're doing it, most a helping of cottage cheese, a scoop of ice cream, a glass of milk, they all have about 250 milligrams, and you want to get to 1,000 milligrams a day. So you could have four helpings of that. That would be an adequate amount of calcium. Mm -hmm. Adults don't often eat that much dairy. They just, yeah, and they don't, they don't, and a lot of adults have uh, lactose problems. That's right, so they can take calcium, and the two most common calciums, there's calcium carbonate, and calcium uh, citrate. Calcium citrate's a little easier on the stomach. It doesn't matter whether you take it with food or without food. So if I had a preference, I'd rather get those 1,000 milligrams of calcium citrate rather than calcium carbonate. And I would actually take 500 milligrams of 500 because the body, if you take 1,000 all at once, you basically can't absorb it all. So you're better off Split just it dividing it. What about foods or drinks to avoid? Uh, for well, bone I mean, it, health. We again, hear about there's some, some things like soda, soda and certain well, phosphorus it's compounds. Carbonic acid in, yeah, they, they, in fizzy soda. Right. Well, what, theoretically, what's happening is you're, 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 the, the bone, you're, you're acidifying the body a little bit, and that kind of leaches bone calcium carbonate as a buffer, so it's coming out of the bone. That happens to some degree. It's not a critical player. It's, you know, it, there are, again, a lot of reasons maybe not to have lots of soda. Uh, but you know, in moderation, I would never say it's a bad thing to do. People who are good for their gallon of Coke a day. Uh, so I would supplements say are avoid. really the, the best way. Uh, I think supplements are the easiest way. Men think, and women should both uh, be taking supplements. Yeah, men, men, men the, the, the recommendations are lower. And again, it's a thousand milligrams a day. So a lot of people reach it through their diet. Uh, but if you took 500 milligrams of uh, calcium and then you had two helpings of dairy. That would be useful. Men over the age of 70 also get osteoporosis more commonly. Yeah, you should so they say should that be supplement. People don't think of osteoporosis and as men in the same breath. That's right. Even hurts. doctors don't. That's right. That's right. And, and again, there are a lot of specific diseases that men can get that can be linked to osteoporosis. But also, as we age, we, we don't have that dramatic decrease in bone density that women might have at menopause. But we are losing, our testosterone yeah. drop slowly, and so do our bone density. So men do get osteoporosis. And at about 70, fractures can begin to happen. Although in a lifetime, a woman has a 40 to 50% chance in her life of having a lifetime-related osteoporotic fracture, whether it's her spine, her hip, or her wrist. That's a it's big a number. High number, men, 20%. Mm -hmm. 
So it's significantly it's less, really but it's still one out of every five. Yeah, I've heard it said that any older man who has a fracture should should have a bone density study. Absolutely. That's definitely correct. A man who fractures, something's wrong. And with that, maybe we can talk a little bit about diagnosis and, and screening. Yeah. Sure. So uh, when well, do you screen? Should, you know, when, do you, when do you screen the average screen? woman? I, I, I probably, I'm, I'm a pretty aggressive screener. I mean, the, 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 the recommendations, again, vary from organization to organization. Uh, but most of them agree age 65 and older women should be screened at least once. And then there are different guidelines on how to screen, how, frequency to screen, how frequently to screen. Uh, a lot of people feel postmenopausally. Uh, women with one or two risk factors should also be screened. Again, we talked about the being too thin, uh, Caucasian, family history, smoking, drinking, a lot of risk factors. You say, oh, this person's really at risk. Mm -hmm. You should at least screen them and see where they stand in the spectrum of osteoporosis. What does the screening entail for a viewer? Uh, well, there are, there are lots of different screenings. I, I have a preference for a thing called a bone density or a DEXA, which stands for dual energy uh, X ray absorptometry. DEX is a lot easier to say. Uh, but what it is, is it, it screens your spine, your axial skeleton, and it screens your hips, and sometimes your uh, wrists as well. And basically, it's looking for bone density. The amount of x ray that goes through the bone depends on the density. The more dense it is, the less x ray goes through, and the computer can tell us how dense your bones are. Uh, if you go to a health fair, you'll often see an ultrasound of the heel. I was going to ask about that. Uh, Ultrasounds of the heel are actually not bad as a screen. They do correlate. The problem is they don't correlate as well with fracture risk as the DEXA does. And the other thing is they're very, it's very hard to use a ultrasound to follow your response to therapy. They're just not that precise. So if you had one to choose, I would choose the DEXA. And if you, or should, should ask you, when do you start to treat? If you see someone who has the osteopenia, which means decreased bone, or when they have full-blown osteoporosis. Well, again, I, not to get to the guidelines, but yeah. there's, there's three grades. There's normal, then there's less dense but not critical called osteopenia, and there's osteoporosis. Uh, the guidelines, you actually kind of agree on this, which, which is surprising in guidelines. Uh, they all recommend treating people who meet criteria for true osteoporosis. Their fracture risk is quite high. There's also some guidelines that say that based on osteopenia, which is the middle ground, there's a calculation you can do. It was actually done. It's called the FRAX, uh, which is a cute little name for fracture. But it's a FRAX calculation. And you can tell a person their predicted risk over 10 years. Uh, and the guideline says if their risk of fracturing any bone is greater than 20% in 10 years, or their risk of fracturing their hip is greater than 3% in 10 years, it's cost effective and risk benefit positive to treat them. And we should point out, we've run out of time, but there are some very effective medicines out now there are, there are some to things treat you, us. Things you can do and wonderful medications that as well. are beyond the vitamin D and calcium. So they, you'll, have real, me, you'll have me we'll back. We'll have you back, exactly yeah, so what we, I was going to say, and talk more <clears> about Unfortunately, our time is up. We want to thank Dr. Robert Olbaum for joining us today. And thank you for watching. Please remember to send us your questions and comments at healthtalk at wchn.org. And keep your bones healthy and strong. Be well.